Today is a good morning. Yes. No, I mean it's really, really a good morning. No, you don't understand what a good morning this really is. Amen. Please close that door behind you. Got it. <laughs> it's such a good morning because you are going to be so excited about our topic this morning. You are going to be so glad you came this morning. Uh, Elijah's sitting by the brook, okay? from last week and the week before. But he's sitting by the brook right now, and we're just going to leave him at the brook for a while. Uh, he's just going to have to sit there for another week before we get back to Elijah at the brook. Because today, we have probably one of the most top, important topics in God's Word to talk about. Are you ready? Yeah. We're going to talk about sin this morning. <laughs> And the door needs to be shut and locked. <laughs> so, <laughs> so if I see anybody even wiggle in your seats. Sin. I think we should pray first. You, you all can just cry out to God and say, God, please not me this morning. Father, I thank you that we can come to your word, that you teach us truth, and you bring us revelation and understanding. And so, Lord, this morning as we look at one of the topics in your word that aren't our favorite, perhaps, but, Lord, they should be. For, Father, you direct us, you guide us, you teach us, and you love us so much that your heart is for us to not move into sin. But sometimes, Lord, it seems it's so easy, we don't even realize what we're doing. Other times, Father, we make choices, and we know exactly what we're doing. So, Father, this morning, as we open your word, I pray that you've prepared each heart to hear what you have to say. Touch us with your Holy Spirit. Convict us if need be. Lord, we know that you love us, and that if there is redemption, and there is repentance, and there is forgiveness. So, in the name of Jesus Christ, we bring this message this morning. Amen. The title for this message this morning is The First Stone. Comes from John chapter 8, starting with verse 1 and going through verse 11. John chapter 8, starting with verse 1 through 11. We're going to read those scriptures. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again to the temple. And all the people were coming to him, and he sat down and he began to teach them. You know, something you maybe not ever notice when you're reading the Bible, but when you're studying, when Jesus would teach what seems to be the most important things, he was always sitting. Isn't that interesting? He was always sitting. Often he taught while he walked with the people. He talked while he, they stood on the shore of Galilee, but, but often he was sitting. Verse 3, And the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery, and having set her in the midst, they said to him, remember they're challenging him now, they want to see what he's going to do. Teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. I just have a question for you. I don't think she was in the act of adultery all by herself. <laughs> Had to be somebody else present. Yes. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. What then do you say? Oh, now here's a challenge. And they were saying this, testing him in order that they might have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground. But when they persisted in asking him, he straightened up and said to them, He who is with... Can we read this together? Let's read it together. He who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And when they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones. Interesting, isn't it? And he was left alone and the woman where she was in the midst. And straightening up, Jesus said to her, Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? And she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I. 
condemn you. Go your way. From now on, sin no more. It's interesting that when the, all the Pharisees disappeared, the older ones went first. Why do you suppose the older ones disappeared first? They had more time to be sinning. They were older. They had, right away, all kinds of things came to their mind. The younger ones weren't so sure in the beginning, but oh, right, that's right, I did. So the older ones went out first, looking at all the older men here. So, I just want to point out that when they did this, there was no man in view. They brought her alone. There was no man in view, no man standing with her. Romans 3.23. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned. How many have sinned? All. all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every one of us has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Matthew 5, verses 27 and 28. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks on a woman to lust for her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. Now those are strong words. Matthew 5, 27, 28. Those are strong words. So my husband and I were talking about this the other night because this message has been in my heart for several weeks now building in my heart. And so my husband and I were talking about this, talking about in the mind. And he started to laugh and he said, oh, is that like that time we were in Hawaii when he said, I walked into a telephone pole? <laughs> what he meant was, we were walking down the sidewalk in Lahaina and he got so involved with a woman across the street <laughs> that he walked right smack into a telephone pole. <laughs> And I said to him that moment, with all the compassion I could muster up, serves you right. <laughs> the church today doesn't hear very much about sin from the pulpit. The church today doesn't talk very much about sin because it just isn't a pleasant subject. We don't broadcast a month ahead of time that on such and such a date we're going to talk about sin because I'd be talking to three of you, maybe. <laughs> So it's always, we put it as a surprise. But I had a pastor friend years and years ago, probably 30 years ago, and he made a comment. He and the senior pastor and I were in the office one day and some things had happened at the church. And he said, he said, you know the problem with the church today? The church today does not want to call sin, sin. They want to say, well, I made a little mistake. Or I, I forgot for a little while. Um, they want to pretend that it's not sin, it's just a little mistake. But in God's eyes, sin is not a mistake. Sin is a choice. Turn to someone and say, it's a choice. It's often been said of sin, I like this, it will take you further than you intended to go. It'll cost you more than you intended to pay. And it will keep you longer than you intended to stay. Isn't that true? Sometimes we think, well, this is just, you know, I, I, I'm just going to, I'm just going to go in the bar. I can, I can have a Diet Coke at the bar. So I'm just going to go in there. Is that a sin? No. no, that's not a sin. Because you can. Just. Maybe. However, after a few times of doing that as well, what's one beer? For someone who has a problem with alcoholism, that's just the beginning. So, sin is mentioned 388 times in the Bible. It is something that God takes very seriously. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 through 21. Galatians 5, verse 19 through 21. Let me know when it's up there. Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality. 20. Idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, 
21. Envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, which I forewarn you just as I have forewarned you that those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, that seems pretty clear, doesn't it? That's Paul speaking in Galatians. Galatians, nothing is hidden from the eyes of the Lord. That's maybe the scariest part. Maybe that's the one thing we need to really remember. When I was a young teenager, when I was a teenager growing up, my father was very much a, a, a wildlife supporter, a believer of wildlife laws, of protection for wildlife. He would never break a law that had to do with wildlife, no matter what. Not that he broke any other laws either, but, but he was a believer in limits of fish, bagging deer. I used to go hunting with him at that time. And so, but as a teenager, I don't know if this still happens up here, but a lot of teenagers want to go spearing walleyes in the, when they're running in the spring. No different in my day. I lived way out in the woods, way out and past Cross Lake. And so all the teenagers would say, let's go, we're going to go spearing tonight. I couldn't go. Are you kidding? My dad's best friend was the game warden. I could not be caught spearing, period. I was more afraid of my father than I was of God, if you understand what I'm saying. We need a healthy respect and a fear of the Lord. But we don't have any. Really, we don't have any. We don't fear the Lord. We think he's a loving, gentle, kind God. He would not cause us any harm. Well, the way I read the Bible, God is a God of retribution also. Nothing is hidden from the eyes of the Lord. Jeremiah said that God's eyes, were, God's eyes were upon all the ways of the sons of men. All the ways. May I say it again. Nothing you do, nothing you say, nowhere you go, nothing that you think, nothing that you are is hidden from the eyes of God. That's pretty, that takes some, I mean you really have to think about that. Everything you think God knows about. Everything you do, he knows. Whether it's in the dark, in your bedroom, with your computer and pornography, he knows. <coughs> Whatever it is you're doing, he knows. Whatever it is you're thinking, he knows. Everyone sins. Nobody is saying amen. amen. <laughs> so, 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. We say that we have, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Sin is deceptive. And the sting of sin is in the tail. Do you understand? The sin, the sting of sin is in the tail. It means in the very beginning it may feel all right. In the very beginning it may not seem that bad, but it's the consequences that occur. Sin disturbs and disrupts every single human relationship. Whether between man and man, man and creation, or man and God. Shall I repeat that? Sin disturbs and disrupts every human relationship. Whether between man and man, man and creation, or man and God. Men, and this is the generic men, men and women, are much more prone to excuse their sin than they are to examine it. We don't want to examine when the Holy Spirit puts a finger in our heart and says, uh-uh-uh. We don't want to really look at that. We don't even want to really hear what the Holy Spirit's saying. And if somebody comes to us and says, you know, that's a sin, we don't really want to hear that either. So what do we do with it? We rationalize it. Well, everybody does it. Sin is a poison that destroys our soul. Here's an illustration. This is a true story. When Leonardo da Vinci was preparing to paint his masterpiece, which most of the world is aware of, entitled The Last Supper, he sought long and diligently for a model who could be for him the face of Jesus Christ. At last, he located a young singer in one of the churches of Rome who had an outs outstanding facial features, a young man by the name of Pietro Brandendel Brandinelli. Years passed, and the painting remained unfinished. 
And Da Vinci was able to finish everything but the final character who was Judas Iscariot. But he could not find a face that represented to him the degradation and the dreadfulness and the evil of Judas. So he looked long and hard to find a man whose face was hardened and distorted by sin. And at last, on the streets of Rome, he found a beggar with a face so villainous that he shuddered even when he looked at him. <coughs> he immediately hired the man to sit as the model for Judas Iscariot, and he painted his face on the canvas. When he was about to dismiss the man, he said, By the way, I've not asked your name. To which the man replied, replied My name is Pietro Brandanelli. I was the one who sat as your model for Christ. The sinful life of years had so disfigured the man's face that that which was once fair beauty of youth now was debased. And that's what sin does to everyone, the whole human race. It is the degenerative power in the human stream that makes man susceptible to disease, disaster, illness, death, and yes, hell. Every broken marriage, every disrupted home, every shattered friendship, every evil thought, every evil word, every evil deed, every heartache, every distressing trouble can be attributed to sin. Sin comes in many forms. Let's look at the general forms, the way that sin comes into our life, and then let's look at the subcategories and under each form and see if any of us can relate. Things we might call common sins, those everyday little sins. Everybody does them. Lying on our taxes, under governmental laws, <coughs> speeding, maybe, hunting licenses, to a spouse about how the money was spent, the measurements of a fish. <laughs> Stealing. Pornography. No one will know. You're all by yourself. Just you and the computer. Lust. Fornication. Adultery. And on. And on. And on. If I could take you on a tour of hell, and we could peer over the guardrails and see what sin has done. It couldn't even begin to tell the whole story. So come on. Your battle is not a drug. Your battle is not alcohol. Your battle is not with a spouse. Your battle isn't with a magazine. Your battle isn't with the internet. Your battle is with and if you ever get God's power working in your life and his blood covering your soul, that battle is a battle we don't have to lose. Amen. A person's former condition before becoming a believer was not that of sinlessness, but that of being a sinner. A Christian, listen closely, never becomes sinless. Amen. Honey, would you close that door, please? A Christian never becomes sinless. For sinlessness would be complete, perfect accomplishment of all that God had purposed in your life. For sin means to miss the mark. Not the mark that I place on my life. Not the mark that I want to reach. But the mark that God wants me to reach. But that which God places on each individual. God has a goal for each one of us. God has a mark that each one of us are to reach. Each one of us. There's not a single person on the face of this earth that could honestly say that in every moment of faith in their life that they had honestly reached the mark that God had appointed for them. Who has truly known what God's purpose in his life has been and that he, was, that he has met it fully. God's expectation of him. Not one of us here could say, I have met God's expectation of me fully. Of course not. Do I strive for that? Yes, I strive to follow him to the best of my ability. Do I make mistakes? And oh, I hate to say this, do I sin? You seem hesitant to say yes. But you can, you know. Because there is that flesh side of me. There is that human side of me that each of one of us carries with us. So, in that respect, one has to remember that even the sin of omission 
is a sin. Not doing what one knows he ought to do is a sin, according to James 4, verse 17. Therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. Doesn't that seem simple? That seems so minor. Doesn't seem like the same sin as pornography, does it? But God calls it sin. And whenever we sin, we separate ourselves from God a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. From the moment a person believes, from the very moment that he comes to salvation, he has two natures. One, the old nature is, is, is as incorrigible as ever. The old nature ha does not change. And the new nature, which cannot sin. Those two natures in each one of us are in a constant battle. Listen to what Paul has to say about his struggle against the conflict of the two natures. Turn to Romans 7. Romans 7, verses 14, starting with verse 14. If Paul struggled with sin, <laughs> I guess that means you and I will struggle with sin. If we struggle with those two natures, the nature before I came to know the Lord and the nature that he has given me. Chapter 7, starting with verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of flesh, sold into bondage to sin. For that which I am doing, I do not understand. For I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I'm doing the very thing I hate. Am I talking to anybody here? Or is Paul talking to anybody here? Okay. But if I do the very thing I do not wish to do, I agree with the law, confessing that it is good. So now, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which indwells me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, for the wishing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I wish, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not wish. But if I am doing the very thing I do not wish, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wishes to do good. Wow. For I joyfully, verse 22, for I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, 23, but I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Who sets him free? Jesus Christ. So then, on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other with my flesh the law of sin. If, if Paul struggled with it, we say, well, I'm struggling on occasion. Romans 6, 11, therefore the believer is to reckon himself to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. But should the believer become unwatchful, Fail to reckon himself dead, dead. The old nature immediately manifests its present by producing its evil feats. Sin. Referring to the act of sin as its product, not sinfulness itself. One fundamental truth, however, which ought to be borne in mind, is that the believer who performs acts displeasing, displeasing to God, not habitually, not practicing, not continuing to do it, but as a digression, listen closely, has not ceased to be a child of God. Amen. Has not ceased to be a child of God. Communion's interrupted. Joy may be lost, but the relationship remains untouched. That's the hope that we have. That's the promise that we have from the Lord Jesus Christ. When we sin, not practicing sin, not daily doing these things that we know are wrong, but finding, getting into a digression and doing something we knew we shouldn't do and then realizing, oh my Lord, what have I done? And then repenting, communion with the Lord is restored. Can anybody say praise God? Praise God. God is still his or her father. And the believer is still his child. 
When the believer occasionally sins, he's like a naughty child, wayward, rebellious, disobedient. And he has done what a child ought not to have done. He has sinned. Mainly, for the moment, he has allowed himself to sink to the world's level and the condition he was in when God lifted him up out of grace and saved him for Christ's sake. His conduct has not been one that honors God. He, he or she have broken communion with God. Broken covenant. For he has allowed the flesh to act, which God has judged and set aside forever. There are two kinds of sins. The sins committed by those who have never been born again as part of their sinful nature. And the sins which are committed as transgressions by those who have been born again. The believer sins as a child of God, not as a person totally unrelated to God. So let's look at if it's not more grievous to sin as God's child than to sin as a sinner from God. Isn't it more grievous when a child of God sins? Is it not more grievous to God than it is when someone in the world sins? Certainly it's grievous to God when anyone sins, but when a child of God sins, when one of his children sins, how that grieves the heart of God. Because he sins against the one who has shown him perfect grace. The one who loves him and has adopted him as a child. Would we treat our own child who has willfully damaged our property in the same manner that we would if some vandal broke into our home and destroyed everything? No, no we would not. As a parent, we would conduct, we would correct our child for his own good. There might be some punishment. In the case of the other, as a citizen, we would turn him over to the government and let them deal with him. It's not, a, it's not our problem. The judgment brought upon our own child is a judgment of grace. Grace. And the judgment brought upon a stranger by the law is simply the application of the law. When the believer sins, he still remains a child of God but brings himself under the government dealings of God as a result. I would rather be under the hands of God Amen. than I would be under the hands of men. Yes. Repentance brings us to restoration. Praise God. Your suffering does not escape the eyes of the crucified one. The suffering that comes from sin, and there will be always suffering that comes from sin, God sees it all today. He sees your hurtful past. He sees even your present painful times. He sees your suffering. He sees your sins which remain exposed and unforgiven. And he sees your thoughts. Nothing is hidden from him as we said before. But there's one thing that he can never see. Don't you wonder what that is? What is that one thing that God can never see? He could see the rebellion in Lucifer's heart, but he couldn't see this. He could see the sin of Adam and Eve, but he can't see this. He could see the wickedness of man before the flood, but he can't see this. He could see the diabolical ambitions of the men at Babel, but he can't see this. He could see the sins of adultery and murder that David committed, but he can't see this. He could see Nathaniel while he was still sitting under the fig tree, but he can't see this. When we come to the Lord after a digression, after a sin, and we repent to him, our sin is covered in what? His blood. And he no longer sees that sin. He looks down at you and he doesn't see that sin. He looks down at you who have repented and he sees what? His son. He sees the blood of Christ. He no longer sees that sin. Can anybody say amen? Amen. All right. So the good news. Galatians chapter 6, starting with verse 1, 1 through 4. Galatians chapter 6, 1 through 4. Brethren, even if a man is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself, lest you be tempted. 2. Bear one another's burdens and thus fulfill the law of Christ. Three, or if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Four, but let each one examine his own work. Romans 8, 28. 
Romans 8, 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. 29. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many believers. 30. And whom he predestined, these he also called, and whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? 32. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? 33. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. 34. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. And so when we digress and we commit a sin, who is interceding for us? Jesus. Jesus. He's interceding for us that we will open our spiritual eyes and open our spiritual ears and remember from where we have come as a child of God. 36, just as it is written, for thy sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. 37, but in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. 38, for I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Nothing can separate us. The digression that we make, the sin that we commit, with repentance, nothing can separate us because we are children of God. When the sin is confessed and there's true self-judgment, full repentance, the believer is forgiven and restored to communion with God. But even then, even then, even after all of that, he or she is often permitted to suffer the temporal consequences of the wrongdoing in bodily suffering, circumstances, or otherwise. It is true that God forgives our sins, but we have to bear the consequences of our sins. This is an emphasis in 1 John. We won't go there. If self-judgment is lacking, most surely the disobedient believer will come under the chastening hand of God. One thing remains. That song, God's love never fails. It never gives up on me. It never runs out on me, and it never runs out on you, no matter what. So in closing, <laughs> this is just the first close, Deb. <laughs> the first thing that Noah did when he stepped off the ark was build an altar. And you and I have an altar built, and it's Jesus Christ sits on that altar. But when we digress, we move away just a little bit from the altar. The second thing that Noah did is he sacrificed on that altar. The third thing he did, anybody remember? He planted a vineyard. And the fourth thing he did was make wine from that vineyard. And the fifth thing that he did was get intoxicated from that wine. The farther he got from the altar, the farther away from God he went. Shall I say that again? The farther he got from the altar, the farther he got away from God. It's time to come back to the altar. It's time to get back to the altar, brothers. It's time to get back to the altar, sisters. Remember, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. We need to bring those sins of digression to the altar to renew our relationship with our Lord. And following the totality of this message today, there will be a couple teams to pray up here with you as the Holy Spirit moves in your heart to say it's time for you to come closer, come back to the altar, bring it to the altar. I'm going to close in prayer. Father, thank you for your word. I pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit touches each one of us, Lord. 
for all of us have sinned. And Father, we come to you with repentance and we say, forgive us, Father. We did know what we were doing. But Lord, we want to come back to the altar. We want to be back in full communion with you. And we pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen.